Good morning and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 29th of May and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 1st of June and it's been a very another positive week I'm going to say a very positive week it's been another positive week for equity markets driven higher largely on the back of optimism um, significant optimism on the relaxation of uh, lockdowns from from various countries across Europe the UK economy is slowly starting to make plans for opening up from the 1st of June um, dentists reopening on the 8th of June and non-essential retail on the 15th of June obviously with the added caveat that um, it's obviously contingent on no increases in infections or death rates in the intervening time. Um, one of the things that's been notable about this week's price action for European and US equities in general has been the fact that while we've been going higher, markets have been fairly content to ignore the rising tension um, that's been um, gaining traction in, in Hong Kong. Um, the US-China relationship over that, the various smoke signals that have been coming out of um, that region for most of this week, suggesting a, comp a, a confrontation um, was, was brewing. I mean, US markets turned tail sharply last night um, on reports that President Trump is going to be holding a press conference later today. Um, obviously today being Friday the 29th of May at uh, just before 10 a.m. UK time on the very subject of China. Giving you a little bit of background you can see straight away that um, the FTSE 100 has had a fairly decent week. We're still in the overall uptrend. We've made a marginal new high um, from the levels that we saw at the beginning of March. What's interesting to note however on this particular chart is we haven't actually um, managed to fill this gap. This gap is acting as resistance just to below uh, 6,400. If we look at that, that tie there, six, between 6,300 and 6,400, there's a 100 point gap. So that's likely to act as resistance going forward. We've seen a bit of a pullback today um, um, over um, a little bit of apprehension as we come into the weekend and month end. So there could be a little bit of um, portfolio adjustment going on ahead of the fact that it's going to be the 1st of June on Monday and as a result we're seeing a little bit of weakness there but nonetheless we still very much remain in buy the dip mode when it comes to equity markets in general. If we look at the German DAX we can see once again we've had a um, fairly decent rise every single day this week. We haven't as yet taken out the 200 day moving average um, but obviously the, this afternoon's press conference or today's press conference could well prompt a little bit of a sell-off, particularly if President Trump is particularly strident when it comes to his tone around China. To give you a little bit of a background, the US House has passed a bill earlier this week authorizing sanctions against senior Chinese officials for human rights abuses against Muslim minorities. Um, now, obviously China also passed um, legislation earlier this week uh, passing the security bill with respect to its oversight of Hong Kong which approved that um, earlier this week. So there's an awful lot of what I would call diplomatic toing and froing, tap dancing if you like between the US and China over this and there has been some talk that the US State Department could actually withdraw the special dispensation that Hong Kong has when it comes to its trading relationship with the United States. Um, unlike China, Hong Kong doesn't have any tariffs on any of its goods between it and the United States, even though it is, strictly speaking, part of China. It still benefits from the special dispensation and trading relationship that is that was safeguarded as a result of the 1997 um, agreement that basically um, agreed the two systems, uh, one country. Um, uh, format that is currently 
um, in dispute, shall we say, between the US, China and the, and, and the rest of the world. So watch this space, I think, is probably the best thing that we can do. But in the absence of the noise from the news, the price action looks fairly solid when it comes to where markets are going. The S&P 500 has managed to push above the 200-day moving average. R regular viewers will know that I've been watching that particular level for quite some time. We have currently broken above it. We're trading around the 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level of the entire down move from the all-time highs that we saw earlier this year to the, um, to the reaction lows um, that we saw in early March. So we're at a very key inflection point when it comes to the S&P 500. The NASDAQ has retested the highs of earlier this year, the all-time highs. So at the moment, um, markets are going to be very, very reactive, not only to the news out of China, but also as relaxation of the lockdowns um, get rolled out, they will be reactive to any rise in the infection rate or the death rate that could cause these lockdowns to be tightened back up again. But overall, it's a, it's a fairly positive tone. It's a fairly positive week. It's a fairly positive month, despite the fact that we're trading a little bit lower today. I mean, the fact that we've got a 6,100 marker on the FTSE 100 is very good news when you consider where we were a month ago. Um, so looking ahead to next week, we've got a plethora of important announcements. We've got the US employment report um, for, for May. And all the while we've seen these the, the, the rebound in equity markets over the course of the past few weeks, the economic data has been pretty much as bad as we thought that it would be. Weekly jobless claims in the US have continued to come in at the million level, or two million level in fact, and now um, total jobless claims over the course of the past um, six to seven weeks total 40 million people. So um, the one silver lining that we took from this week's jobless claims numbers was the fact that the continuing claims declined from 25 million to 21 million. So maybe the reopening of the US economy is starting to see some rehiring of some workers that were out of work in the early part of the lockdowns. But it's very difficult to extrapolate that from just one number. We want to see that played out over the course of several weeks. But certainly in terms of the weekly jobless claims, they continue to come down on a weekly basis. Yes, they are still a very, very high, um, but they're not going, they're not increasing on a week to week basis. They, 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 they're coming down from the peak that we saw on the first week, albeit at a much, at a much slower rate. Um, so, so going back to what I was saying before, um, the key items that I've got my eye on this week are the US employment report, which is due out on the Friday, the 5th of June. And while we'll be paying close attention to that, now obviously last month's April payrolls report confirmed what most of us already knew, that we'd see a record number of Americans lose their job in April. When the final number was released, we came in slightly below expectations at 20.5 million. But nonetheless, when the ADP number is also added, which is due out on the Wednesday, it's spelled out as a sorry tale of economic misery for a huge number of people. So Friday's payrolls report is expected to be a multi-million number. It won't be anywhere near the April number, but each job loss will still be felt equally as painfully with another 8 million jobs expected to be lost, while the ADP payrolls report is expected to shed another 9.5 million jobs on top of the 20 million that we saw in April. So that would take the total number of jobs lost over the last two months to over 50 million jobs, over a quarter or nearly a quarter of the American workforce. So that's going to push the unemployment rate up from 14.7% close to that 20% level that we've, we've been talking about over the course of the past few weeks. So it's not expected to be a pretty picture when it comes to the payrolls report. We've also got PMIs coming out next week. Um, you know, and in, in that context, I think we can safely say that while the manufacturing PMIs haven't been anywhere near as bad as the services PMIs, we would expect to see an improvement 
in the services PMIs. Now they're coming out on the 3rd of June and the 4th of June. Um, the reason I think the possibility that European PMIs could be coming out a day later and the same day as the European Central Bank meeting, that's also a very, very key um, key economic, uh, um, macroeconomic uh, indicator that I'll be keeping an eye out for later this week is because it's a French and German bank holiday on Monday. So there could be a delay in those services PMIs coming out on the Thursday. So what can we expect from the services PMIs? Well, after the horror show of the recent record lows that we saw in April, um, we, we, I think we can expect to see an improvement. Certainly the flash PMI numbers that we saw from France and Germany and the UK did see improvements from the record lows in April. Um, 29.4, 31.4 and 27.8 were a significant improvement from the teen numbers, the low teen numbers that we saw in the April numbers. We're also expected to see an improvement from the record lows of 7.1 for Spain and 10.8 for Italy. Um, irrespective of you know where the numbers come in, they still point to an awful contraction in the second quarter. So, you know, it's really you take what comfort you can from the fact that the numbers are still pretty awful. Um, the ECB rate meeting. Now, there's been an awful lot of optimism and we can see that reflected in euro dollar over the course of the past four days. This week, we've seen a very, very decent rebound in euro dollar on the basis of this EU commission. And you can see that on the weekly chart, it sort of really does bear it out quite nicely. Um, on the back of this EU Commission proposal um, to issue 500 billion euros in grants and 250 billion euros in loans to the um, most badly affected um, countries in Europe um, by the global pandemic. Pandemic. Let's not forget that Italy, Spain, and Greece are going to be the worst affected simply because of their debt dynamics. Um, but also because of the fact they rely so heavily on tourism for um, their economic growth. And when you look at the travel restrictions and everything else, it's going to be very, very difficult for those countries to show any type of economic growth this year. Um, and I think that's why there is an awful lot of uncertainty and nervousness about the haste that these countries are taking in terms of reopening their economies to tourists so soon after they've locked down or uh, so soon after they started to ease their lockdowns given the horrible death rates that we've seen in both Italy and Spain. Um, so um, you know there is some optimism about this proposal. I think there's too much optimism about this proposal because ultimately the money is not going to be agreed anytime soon and what they really do need is the money right now. Um, but given the fact that an awful lot of countries in Europe, well, there's three or four countries in Europe, are opposed to the idea of grants without any types of conditions attached to them, this is set to be a fairly um, intense fight between the frugal four, as they're known, um, Austria, the Netherlands, Sweden and Denmark, um, with respect to signing off on billions of euros of loans without or grants without any conditions attached to them whatsoever. And it's unlikely that um, any agreement is going to come anytime soon, given the fact the next EU summit is on the 18th or 19th of June. Um, and no one could argue that the, these countries don't actually need the help now, as opposed to um, sometime next year. So the ECB rate meeting, why is that important? Well, it's important for a number of reasons. The main reason being that the recent German constitutional court decision which compelled the ECB to justify its rationale around its 2015 asset purchase program will have prompted some nervousness, I think, amongst ECB officials about um, being too overly aggressive with their current pandemic emergency purchase program, which, um, while wasn't ruled on by the Constitutional Court, um, could well find itself under the spotlight, given the fact that it has much looser criteria in implementation than the one that the German Constitutional Court ruled against. So for me, the ECB has a mountain to climb if it wants to convince markets it can do much more 
than it already has done without signaling um, that um, they could face further challenges if they go further in extending the PEP program, which is due to expire in October. Now, to my mind, they have no choice. They have to send a signal that they remain to do whatever it takes to try and support the Eurozone economy while the politicians bicker about the recovery fund, because the recovery fund is unlikely to be available this year. It's probably going to be available sometime early next year if there is an agreement. So the ECB has to act as a bridge. And the market has to believe that they can act as a bridge. So this recovery fund um, is going to be front and center, but it's going to be well down the line. So my expectation is that they will likely try and extend the, the, the PEPP beyond the October expiry um, and look to extend it towards the end of the year. Um, so what does that mean for euro dollar? Well, we've certainly seen that euro dollar has been pretty much in a range for most of the last three to six months. I don't expect that to change. It's a big barrier up in and around these levels here, the, the March, the 26th and 27th of March highs, around about 111.50. But even if we are able to move much above here, I still don't really see that much in the way of upside, particularly if the macro outlook dissipates and the markets get spooked as a result of the US and China starting to get more aggressive with each other. That's likely to prompt the dollar to go up and push the euro lower. So I still think it's very much a range trade as far as euro dollar is concerned. If we look at sterling dollar, the cable, we continue to remain in a fairly decent uptrend here um, from the lows that we saw in March, albeit the rebounds are starting to get a little bit um, tentative in and around here. We haven't seen much of a rebound off this line. We've just about respected it. We really need to move back through 124 to retest the highs here, but also the 200 day moving average, which is likely to be a fairly key level um, when it comes to further gains for the pound against the dollar. So again, here with respect to the pound, very much within a range and likely to remain within that range, notwithstanding the fact that as we head into June, pressure will be brought to bear to either agree on a Brexit extension deadline or um, uh, try and push the deadline or push the push the timetable for agreeing to an extension beyond July, because that's 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 the date that's written into the withdrawal agreement that if, if the UK wants an extension, they have to apply for one by July. But at the moment, the pound still looks, to my mind, it's it, it's finding it difficult to go up with any degree of confidence, but dips still remain fairly well supported and for me the, the really big level I think on the pound is this red line here on this chart here it's 119.85 120 that for me is the real line in the sand uh, you know as long as we are able to close on a monthly basis above 120 then I'm still very much of the opinion and it's very counterintuitive there's more upside than downside so that that's that's really I think the way I'm looking at the pound against the dollar as as we look as we as we look ahead and certainly in terms of the improvement on the economic side of things we're we're likely to see a pickup in the data um as as we look as we as we head into june and july and and the fact that the unemployment rate thus far hasn't gone up too significantly largely as a result of the government's furlough scheme which does now look as if it's going to be extended um into october though how that is funded could actually prompt a little bit of weakness, particularly now that we're seeing evidence of significant job losses starting to trickle down into the overall data with um, companies like EasyJet, um, International Consolidated Airlines who own British Airways, um, Rolls-Royce, all announcing large-scale layoffs. So that is something that's likely to start to filter into the figures over the course of the next three months and could, could act as a little bit of a headwind, but the UK won't be unique in that. Um, we've also got the RBA. Um, the RBA is due to make a rate decision um, this week. Not really expecting too many surprises from the RBA. Um, the Aussie is finding upside a little bit difficult at the moment. 
a little bit of resistance around the 200 day moving average with all this stuff about china um there could be some headwinds there running into resistance um so for me i think i'd be very reluctant to get overly long of aussie at these sorts of levels um maybe look to start to fade some of this aussie strength that we've been seeing over the course of the past few days and weeks um look for a little bit of a correction lower i think philip lowe has made it quite clear the uh, governor of the rba that um he would probably reach the lower bound when it comes to interest rates so really the key question will be is the rba prepared to do any more qe than some than than the numbers that we've than the amount of qe that we've already started to see it do um over the course of the past couple of months the government's already announced a three to five year jobs program called job maker i think that has helped push the aussie up this week but at the moment it's finding it very very difficult to get through the 200 day moving average and these highs here around about the 67 the 6670 the 6680 level so keep a close eye on that particular level for resistance in terms of company earnings um we're going to call this the remote revolution company earnings week because there's there's, there's three companies um, reporting this week all of which um could actually find that the working from home has actually um helped them in no small manner we've got halfords um which has seen some decent gains over the course of the past few days um, broken above its 200 day moving average we've got their full year numbers um, and while halfords generally tends to be known for the fact that it has an automotive and auto parts and servicing business it also sells bicycles and it and it and the halfords was classed as an essential business by the uk government so it actually remained open and at the beginning of may halfords said its full year results will be boosted by increased sales during the lockdown which could push profits up to around about 55 million pounds despite this the company did pull the divvy which is, i think is entirely sensible saving it 24 million to help shore up its balance sheet and it suspended its guidance for 2021 it will have benefited from the business rate suspension and i think it will have benefited from increased bicycle sales as well as accessory sales so the big question is is that price is is that all that good news priced in and if it's not can the share price go higher from the lows that we've seen um, in march but also more importantly now that we're above the 200 day moving average is the line of least resistance for halfords to be by the dip for a move higher certainly if we look at this here there does seem solid support in and around 150. Um, so you could conceivably argue that while it's above 150 then the line of least the the risk reward the risk reward trade here is to to, to buy the dip with a stop loss below the 200 day moving average um, zoom video communications well since its ipo it's been pretty much one-way traffic for zoom um, and you know that's a that's a fairly good thing it's one of the things that we've heard in all these zoom video conference calls the downing street press conferences and what have you um, the company priced at 36 dollars a share when it ipo'd just over a year ago um, now look at it it's um 163 dollars um, an awful lot i think of the positivity is already priced in the company is profitable it was profitable when it ipo'd it was one of those very rare beasts um, but let's not forget that revenues are still well short of a billion dollars last year revenues rose to 622 million um, and that pushed the market cap to an eye-wateringly high 44.3 billion right 44 billion when it was around about 180 dollars so it's not even a billion dollar revenue company yet yet the market is a price you know is giving it a valuation of over 40 billion dollars so this year revenues are expected to rise to around about 917 million if it can get it over that billion dollar mark then that might be enough to keep the upward momentum going let's face it valuations are out the window right now so i'm not sure that it really matters but the fact of the matter is if it's able to grow revenues exponentially 
the big question will be whether it can sustain those revenues once the economies start to reopen because once economies start to reopen you may find people don't need zoom anywhere near as much so and it will also prompt you know other companies to up their game as well slack technologies has been a similar sort of outperformer as well um again uh, trading well above its 26 dollars ipo but it's been a tough struggle it, it sold off very aggressively in march it's clawed its way back um q4 update um so and the move towards working remotely we've, we've seen a bit of a renaissance but again like zoom it's going to have to meet those expectations and despite all the optimism over the q1 numbers we are expecting we're still not expecting to see a profit for slack unlike zoom where we are so a loss of six cents a share i think we can safely say that the future for slack looks an awful lot more promising than it did a few months ago the big question is can we make further gains from the post ipo optimism that saw it go up to 44 dollars a share so um, those are the three key companies that i'm keeping an eye out for this week we do have a couple of other items um tiffany has got first quarter numbers um lvmh bought them as you may remember um at the end of last year but also workspace group um which has had a pretty tough time of it recently and was a favorite for um, small and medium size and startup businesses because of the fact that it was able to provide fairly um, cheap office space um, which had super mask, super fast connectivity on short-term leases their share price has taken a bit of a beating and they're 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 they're, they're publishing their four-year numbers on the 3rd of june so um, that's really i think a quick preview of the week ahead let's just have a quick finish up by looking at brent crude seen a nice little move higher in brent crude over the course of the past few days what's significant i think is that we've managed to move above this horizontal line here on the cash chart and have thus far managed to hold above it now the big question is can we sustain the move higher that we've seen over the course of the past week or so above 32 dollars a barrel um, if if we're looking at the slow stochastic i would suggest the momentum is starting to fade a little bit but until such times as we trade below this level here, then I think there could be a further squeeze higher, particularly if there are no setbacks to the economic reopening of the various economies. Because if the, if the economic reopenings happen on the timeline that governments have laid out, then demand should pick up, supply should drop, and prices should edge back towards $40 a barrel at the moment. Um, we remain in a bit of a no man's land when it comes to, you know, will the econ economic reopenings happen on schedule or will there be setbacks? And I think that's why crude oil prices are in a little bit of a no man's land at the moment. Looking at gold prices, um, still very much by the dip. Um, if we look at this chart that I've that we looked at last week, we've fallen back a little bit but what we haven't done is we haven't fallen below this trend line here so i think we're above this trend line here for gold then we still remain very much in an uptrend for gold prices and my gold price target for the end of the year remains intact we're still there 1800 dollars an ounce the trend is very much towards the upside yes we have fallen back over the course of the past few days but significantly we haven't taken out this lower trend line here and until such times as we do i think it's very much a case of buy the dip for gold while we're above $1,690 an ounce okay so um that's pretty much it for um this week ladies and gentlemen i hope everyone is enjoying the warm weather i certainly am hay fever notwithstanding it's always a little bit tricky when you when you suffer from hay fever in the same way that I do, particularly when you don't have the, the luxury of an air conditioned office to work out of because you're working from home, but we try and make the best of it. Anyway, thank you very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen, and um, speak to you all same time, same place next week.